you come out to a place like this, sit down, close your eyes. We find that the luggage we brought along with us, the physical luggage, is nothing compared to the baggage we're carrying around in our minds. And one of the first tasks in the meditation is to let go of that baggage, because otherwise it keeps interfering, keeps getting in the way. We want to be with our breath, but thoughts of the past, this person, that person, our work, our relationships, issues out in the world, they just keep coming and getting in the way. And so we need some techniques for keeping them at bay. It's one of the reasons why we have these chants at the beginning of the meditation. They give us thinking tools. We often think that meditation is a process of not thinking, but you have to think your way to not thinking. In other words, learn to use your thinking processes in a skillful way before you can let them go. These are the various contemplations we have in the chants are there to help us with that process. Like the chant we had on the world just now, the world is swept away, it does not endure. It offers no shelter, there's no one in charge. One has to pass on, leaving everything behind. The world is insufficient, insatiable, slave to craving. It all sounds pretty negative, but it has a positive use. You can keep reminding yourself every time issues of the world come up in your meditation, just what the world is like. That no matter how nice you wanted the world to be, the world just can't be perfect. It's a liberating thought. The events in your life that you felt that you didn't handle very well, You look back and you realize, well, there's no way that anything could be totally perfect, no, no way that anything could come to total completion. The nature of the world is that everything is left at loose ends. Many times there's a temptation when a thought comes up in the meditation to follow it through, tie up the loose ends, bring it to a conclusion. But the nature of the world is that there are no conclusions. The work of the world never gets done. When people stop working, it's not because their jobs are finished, it's simply that they, they start wearing out. They can't work anymore. They have to leave the work for other people to do. Sometimes it gets picked up by other people, sometimes it doesn't. This is unlike the work of the practice. This is something that can reach conclusion, can come to completion. So as the situation in the world out there is pretty hopeless, the situation in this internal world is not hopeless. Which is why energy devoted to the practice is energy well spent. So think about that every time thoughts of the world come up and get in the way of your meditation. But that's simply the way the world is. It's all incomplete. And then we have the chant on the four sublime abidings. Those are also also useful things to think about. One, in case there are people you've wronged or people have wronged you, you spread thoughts of goodwill. If the image of anybody comes up in your meditation, that should be your first reaction, goodwill for that person. And goodwill not in the sense that you want to get further entangled, but you wish that person well. And the true wishing well is, one, that that person can find true happiness inside, and two, that you can find true happiness inside, too. The more true happiness you can find inside, the better your relationships are going to be with everybody. You don't need to feed on anybody else. You've got your own inner resources. Thoughts of goodwill, thoughts of compassion, thoughts of what they call sympathetic joy or appreciation. Extend those to everybody. And then thoughts of equanimity. 
realizing that ultimately each of us has his or her own karma, his or her own actions. That we're each responsible for our happiness and for our suffering. And so your work right now is to work on your own karma, which is what we're doing as we're meditating. We're working on skillful karma. Noble Eightfold Path, which is the path we're trying to stay on right here. As the Buddha said, that's the ultimate in skillful karma. It harms no one and is beneficial for ourselves, not only in terms of developing happiness within the world, but also taking us beyond the world. It comes down to three things, virtue, concentration, discernment. At the moment we're focusing on the concentration, but all three of them are involved. Virtue is a quality of normalcy in our intentions, harmlessness in our intentions. As we're sitting here meditating, we're not harming anybody at all. Not only, not, only, not only that, we're not planning to harm anybody. We're here focusing on getting our mind straightened out. And discernment comes into the equation as well. You have to be discerning in how you focus your mind. Find a good object to focus on. Once you've cleared the decks through your reflection, look for your breath. It's always there. The question is whether your thoughts obscure it or not. But the kind of thinking that comes from the reflections we had in the chant should help bring you to the breath with a sense of the importance of what you're doing. If true happiness can't be found in the world, well, you can find it here. And working with the breath in and of itself, as the Buddha says, putting aside greed and distress with reference to the world. In other words, any thoughts that would get you entangled in any sense of world outside, just put them aside. If they come up, you try to let them go. Don't let them interfere right here. Because what you're working on is a happiness that doesn't depend on the world. Anything that depends on the world is bound to end up in disappointment, because after all, the world is always at loose ends. But as we work on the mind here, we're developing qualities they don't have to depend on the world, things that come from within. And they're things you can be proud of, good qualities of the mind. Think about the kind of happiness you have, the things you have to do in order to gain happiness in the world. There's always a struggle, there's always competition out there. Resources are limited. If you get something, it means somebody else is not going to get it. And sometimes you have to compete in ways that you don't feel particularly proud about. But as you're meditating, it's all good qualities. Mindfulness, alertness, integrity, honesty, truthfulness, concentration, discernment. These are all good qualities. They feel good. And if you don't, don't get all the way to the goal, the path is a good path to be on. And the sublime abidings also help focus you in on the breath. If you really have good will for yourself, you've got to start right here. Giving the mind a good, firm foundation. A very visceral way of showing good will for yourself is just this, focusing on the breath, allowing the breath to be comfortable. Because you realize many of the things you do in life that you later, you later regret are things that you did because you had a, felt a sense of weakness, a sense of hunger. You needed something out there and you were willing to do anything you could think of to get it. But when you work with a breath like this and there's a sense of comfort, a sense of fullness that comes from within, that sense of hunger goes away, that sense of weakness goes away. 
and you find yourself acting more and more from a position of strength. You learn that you can trust yourself more, that people around you can trust you more as well. So right here is the basis for embodying those four sublime embodies. All these ways of thinking keep pointing you into the breath. In terms of the narratives you tell of your life, they help direct your narrative towards being a person who wants to meditate. That's a sense of the importance of the meditation, is willing to make an effort at the meditation. And so they deliver you right here. These are ways of thinking that, unlike ordinary ways of thinking, which simply entangle you, these disentangle the tangle. Sometimes they cut right through. If you work at disentangling every single tangle in your mind, you're, there'd never be an end to it. You use these th- ways of thinking as knives to cut right through everything. Come right here with the breath, because this is the best thing you can be doing right now. Getting the mind to settle down. Getting a sense of being at home with the breath, being at friends with your breath. Don't think of the meditation as a struggle. If you find that your breath suddenly becomes your enemy, you're really in bad shape. Because wherever you go, there it is. Learn to be friends with it. Listen to it. Work with it. Play with it. Learn how the breath and the mind can cooperate with each other. Comes from paying careful attention. As with any friendship, you it takes time. But that length of time can be shortened if you're really attentive, if you really watch. Try different ways of focusing on the breath, different places in the body where you can focus. Different ways of adjusting the breath. Sometimes all you have to do is just think. And the breath will change. Think comfortable breath. Think full breath. You don't have to do anything else. Just that thought. Maintain that thought and see what happens to the process of breathing in the body. Or if you want, you can play with your focus. Instead of focusing just on one spot, try to focus on two spots at once. I personally always find that riveting. One spot can be in the middle of the head, the other spot can be down in the body. And think of a line connecting the two, and you want to be aware of both of those spots all at once, all the time. When you can maintain that double focus, you you find that your mind doesn't have any other hands to latch onto things. It's like one hand is holding onto one spot, the other hand is holding onto the other. Your hands are full. So there's a lot to play with here in the present moment, a lot to work with. And as you work together with the breath and you play together with the breath, you become friends, you become companions. So instead of taking your thoughts about past and future as your companions, which we do most of the time, suddenly the breath becomes your companion. You have someone to work with, someone to play with all the time. You're never really alone. And you find that the body and the mind become friends. They come into alignment. They strengthen each other. It's as with any harmonious friendship. It's more than just your doubles, doubling your strength. It gets multiplied many times. As you work through your issues, as you get more and more familiar with the territory, This way you can drop a lot of that baggage. Even though you're still holding on to something, you're holding on to something good right here in the present moment. And John Lee's image is of someone carrying a pole over the shoulder with loads on both ends. You see this a lot in Thailand. It's how people carry things around. They have a basket hanging from the front end of the pole and a basket hanging from the back end of the pole. And he says, when you've got a pole over your shoulder like that, it's difficult to sit down. 
because the baskets get knocked all topsy-turvy. So what do you have to do? You take the pole off your shoulder. And then even though you may be holding something in your hands, in other words, you've dropped the past, you've dropped the future, you're holding on to the present moment. When you've got something held in your hands like this, you can sit down. You can rest. Ultimately, you're going to work on letting go of the present. But in the meantime, hold on fast. Because our minds have a tendency to want to grab onto things. So give them something good to grab onto. Otherwise, they'll just start grabbing at anything. So you've got the breath right here. And as you work with the breath, you find that the skill you develop becomes more and more useful. You can deal with any kind of breathing. And when you can deal with any kind of breathing, you can deal with any kind of situation. The breath can help in all kinds of ways. You become the kind of cook who can just walk into a kitchen and no matter what's there in the pantry, no matter what's in the fridge, you can make something really good out of it. Because you're really, you've gotten really familiar with food. You've gotten really familiar with techniques for dealing with food. It's the same with the breath. You find there are all kinds of ways of breathing that help you when you're tired, breathing that helps you when you're tense, breathing that helps you when you're all antsy, breathing that helps you when you're bored. The breathing can help in all kinds of ways if you pay attention, if you give it the time. to really get to know it. So you've got a whole hour right now, you've got whole days right here to work on this friendship. And you find that of all the relationships you can have in this world, this is the one that carries you through all the way to the end and past the end. So it's the one that's most, most worth developing. Everything else comes out of this. If you can't be on good terms with your own breath, it's hard to be on good terms with anybody. So you've got time now to develop this friendship. Make the most of it. <laughs>